Good morning, everyone. Um, I wasn't sure we would get anyone to show up for a food and ag panel in the middle of milk and conference. So I brought my wife, my son, my son-in-law, and five of his friends so we would have somebody. But uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm sure you expected to have a group of old men in overalls up here, but we all tried to dress up and uh, look like investment bankers and not just food and ag people. Um, there's actually a, a lot going on in the, in the food and the ag world, and uh, we have today a cross-section of people from the entire food chain. And uh, let me just quickly start by, uh, by introducing uh, 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 John Hammer. Um, I'm on this side. I'm sorry, John, over there. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, John, uh, John is the managing partner of Monsanto Growth and Venture Capital. Um, as you know, Monsanto is one of the leading seed and agricultural chemical companies in the world um, and is in the middle of a merger with Bayer, the German, German food, German uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, so a lot going on, John, in your area. A lot, yep. Um, Pat Brown on my left. Uh, is the mic working? Yep. Pat Brown is the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods, um, uh, a company that is trying to disrupt the, uh, the whole protein uh, system, um, basically uh, building uh, meat-based products like hamburgers, um, not from meat, but from vegetables and other chemical processes. Um, I told Pat last night that we used to be the largest cattle feeder in the United States. Um, and uh, when we heard that Pat was going to replace real beef, we sold our cattle feeding business and invested in Pat's company. Smart move. <laughs> yeah. um, on my right, um, Mohammed Khan is the uh, Chief Scientific Officer of PepsiCo and Vice Chairman of PepsiCo. Um, in our industry, Pepsi is one of the oldest, one of the largest, and most respected food companies uh, across the food chain, both in beverages and in, uh, in the whole food system. Um, Mohammed, that, nice to have you with us. Good to be here. And uh, all the way on my right, John Vikupitz. If I got that right? Well, close. Vicupitz. <laughs> Vicupitz. Uh, John is the president and CEO of Netafim North America. Uh, Netafim is one of the great Israeli companies. If you've, if you've read the book Startup Nation, um, <laughs> Netafim was, was one of the pioneering companies in drip irrigation and all kinds of water conservation and agricultural production. And today it's a global company. Um, and on the leading edge of, uh, of the agricultural <coughs> production system. So, John, great to have you with us. Thank you. So, just to, just to frame the discussion, um, our industry is going through dramatic change. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, a challenge of people, the way people eat. Um, obesity is a challenge in the Western world. Uh, while the developing world is still struggling with producing enough food. So we have those different challenges. Um, our our ex-mayor of, of New York, Mike Bloomberg, um, tried to come out with a ban for large size sodas. Um, never got anywhere, but that creates challenges for, for you, Mahmoud, in the, uh, in the Pepsi business. Um, we're also challenged by activists and new entries to the food system. Uh, one of our panelists who was supposed to be with us today was John Mackey, who is the, uh, the founder and CEO of Whole Foods. Um, he had to drop out two days ago. Um, he has an activist investor, and there's a threat of a takeover of his company. Um, we have the entrance of people like the 3G, the Brazilian investors in the food and beverage businesses. Um, in full disclosure, we're partners with them in companies like Burger King and Kraft and Heinz. And they're disrupting the management style, the cost structures, um, the operational functions of many of these food systems. Um, and the list, the list goes, goes on and on. And of course, disruptive technologies um, is, a, is a key change for all of us. Um, and maybe that would be a good place to start the discussion. And Pat, um, I would ask each of you to talk about both the challenges and the opportunities um, uh, in the food system and in your companies. And maybe, Pat, if you want to kick it off, um, as sure. you're a major disruptor up here that's going to put all <laughs> of us out of business. No, I'm going to improve your business. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so, uh, well, my company is Impossible Foods. I founded it about six years ago, and um, our mission was basically to completely replace animals as uh, technology for food production. Um, and um, by basically developing uh, better ways to make uncompromisingly delicious meat, fish, dairy foods, and so forth, uh, but more nutritious, more sustainable, um, and um, and, some t and that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but um, actually w one thing that we found early on uh, is that uh, when we talk to a lot of uh, uh, middle America meat consumers, hundreds of them, uh, what we found was that what they valued, let's focus on, on meat, what they value about meat is its unique deliciousness, unique flavor profile, um, its nutritional profile, high protein and iron, and <laughs> affordability, not the fact that it's made from an animal. It's a sort of the same 200 years ago. What people valued about, about horses as power transportation was not the fact that they had four legs and a tail. It was that it got them where they wanted to go faster and could help them carry stuff. And uh, as soon as you say, OK, let's take what they value and figure out a better way to deliver it, you can do the same thing with, with uh, these animal products, make them much less expensively as well as much more sustainably. Uh, it's a completely realistic thing to do. So that's what, what the company is about. We have a product that's just being launched on the market, which is raw ground beef, you could say. Um, it's, it's not made out of vegetables, exactly. It's we take very specifically selected components of plants based on a deep molecular analysis of what makes meat delicious uh, and assemble them together into something that uh, to a meat-loving consumer delivers what they love about meat, which is deliciousness, nutrition, affordability, and they don't value the fact that it's made from an animal. It's actually a negative. So that's, right. that's the idea. So let's do a consumer test here. So how many people would buy Impossible Foods hamburgers if they were the tasted the same, cost the same, and were nutritionally better, but didn't come, they came from plants and not from the natural beef system. Sounds like we've made a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> John, would you like to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities sure. at Monsanto and uh, in your area of the business? Yeah, so um, we're the investment arm of Monsanto. So we have a thesis that the big needs in agriculture are going to be met by entrepreneurs like Pat Brown and others. Um, and we're excited about investing in companies that are going to bring that innovation uh, to food and agriculture. And why do we need that innovation? So we've got a demand side that says we're going to need to increase grain productions 40, 50 percent over the next 20 to 30 years. So that's the demand side. And the frightening thing about that demand side is most of that population is going to be in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. It's not going to be here in the U.S., and it's not going to be in Northern Europe. So how do we deliver more food, increase production, and reduce food insecurity in those parts of the world when they have so many other economic challenges and, and uh, social problems? So that's a big challenge that we have, and later we can hopefully talk about some of the things we're trying to do there. Um, we're excited about entrepreneurs. We're excited that Silicon Valley and the VCs there have put $4.5 billion into ag innovation, ag and, ag and food innovation in the last year. We're excited that data science is finally coming to agriculture. McKinsey Institute did a study and showed that agriculture was one of the most data poor um, kind of areas, data technology poor areas. That's a $4.5 trillion economic opportunity that is poor in data science and technology. So we're excited that entrepreneurs and we are making uh, very significant investments in the data science of agriculture to help farmers be more precise, more exact about what they're doing, understand what their yields are and their returns are going to be, and just be more successful at farming and producing food. And it's not just the farmers in Iowa, it's the farmers in the Ukraine and Argentina, it's the small landholders in India and elsewhere. So how do we make them more successful? How do we keep them food secure? and how do we secure food for a growing planet? Thanks, thanks John. Let, let me just, to be provocative a little bit, both of you have products that are new technology and for consumers, uh, what, what happens if consumers react to the Impossible Foods burger or to the GMO great technology that Monsanto has produced 
and say, we don't understand it, we're afraid, maybe it causes cancer, maybe it, it'll damage us as consumers. You know, you've, you had lived through many years ago a negative reaction to new technology. What happens in the food system if customers around the world, consumers, um, basically say, we like our food the way it's always been, and we're not ready to try the, the new products? Um, well, I can answer uh, for us that um, I think uh, we've thought a lot about that question. And uh, one of our core principles from the get-go was that we are going to be completely transparent, painfully, maybe over-the-top transparent to consumers about everything we're doing and why we're doing it. So um, what we've found is because the ingredients that go into our product, when we show them to a chef, which we've done, and we do this demo where we take all those ingredients that don't look anything like a burger and put them in a mixing bowl and turn them into something that looks and tastes like a burger and you can um, cook it and eat it or eat it as tartare or whatever, um, and they can see that, okay, the chefs would typically say, I have every one of those ingredients in my kitchen right now, okay, they're all familiar, safe, friendly ingredients, except for one, which is a critical ingredient in our product, uh, and that's heme. Heme is, is uh, what makes your blood red, it's what makes meat red, it's a molecule that's found in every living organism on Earth, it's a you know, ubiquitous part of the human diet, it's the biggest source of iron in the human diet. Uh, so it's a very familiar molecule. It's just never been treated as an ingredient in food. When we show this to consumers and talk to consumers about it, we get virtually no uh, pushback whatsoever. Um, and our heme protein is actually produced by engineered yeast. So it's a so recombinant it's not, it's protein. It's not from blood. It's not from blood. It's yeah. produced in yeast uh, that have been engineered with a plant gene that basically enables them to produce this protein. We tell, uh, every time we talk about it, we describe that. And basically, I think what we found is that as soon as you tell them, you don't just use this GMO. Nobody, you know, most consumers are scared of GMOs, but they don't know why. They just know that it's supposed to be bad for them. As soon as you tell consumers, this is what we're actually doing, it's, our experience has been, it immediately becomes a non-issue. Mm -hmm. So it's a legitimate concern, but I don't think, uh, uh, I think it's a little bit over, yeah. overstated. Yeah, so, you know, history lesson there. We thought everybody would read the 2,000 publications that we post online about the safety of GMO crops, and I think <laughs> Monsanto was stunned to realize that people don't read the scientific literature. Um, so we're a very science-driven science company, and it literally was a belief that the science will speak for itself. We sell to farmers. We're not a food company. And that realization went through a very dramatic shift over the last five or six years to suddenly realize we are a food company. Our food, what we start with, the seeds we start with, do reach people's table at some point. And understanding that and involving the public and understanding exactly what our technology is and what it's doing um, has become, you know, one of the single most important things that Montana's been working on over the last few years. That's been challenging, um, for sure. If we look at a new technology that's coming along, and that new technology is gene editing, and I'm not the first one actually at this conference to mention it. It was mentioned in the healthcare panel. So CRISPR-Cas9 and genome editing burst onto the scene in, in kind of 2012. There's a new technology that could really transform the food system in many different ways. Um, and so we've now taken an approach of we can't just be sort of charging along doing this. We've got to get together with all the other stakeholders, so all the other big ag companies, all the NGOs, all the USDA, the, the University of Researchers, and begin to figure out what's the right path if we're going to bring a product that's been gene edited, a food that's been gene edited to the market, how do we bring that food to the market? How do we make sure consumers understand what's going on? So it's much more realizing that we are a food company. We do have consumers. And we've got to be careful about how we explain technology and bring technology. Because it can, it can really do a great job in terms of how it can help the world. But if we don't explain it to people, we open up the opportunity for people to second guess all of that technology and um, create you know, blocks and hindrances to, to that technology getting to the places where it needs to be. So, yeah. Uh, would, would you like to talk about the challenges at Pepsi and the opportunities yeah. you're all dealing with? Well, I think Pepsi, uh, I don't need to tell anybody, anybody in this audience about the company. A lot of people may be surprised in the diversity of our business, uh, whether it's our nutrition business with Quaker or Tropicana or Sabra, the hummus, 
mm -hmm. brand, um, our beverages, our juice businesses, etc. Now, we operate across the world. The opportunity is pretty easy to state in, in theory, and that is we've got a growing population, a growing middle class that is going to increase the demand for food, and our products bring everything that you're hearing about to mm -hmm. life in somebody's pantry and ultimately in their, in their dining table. The opportunity is clear. We're going to have to increase uh, somewhere around 40 percent, most experts would say, in terms of the food supply within the next three decades. Now, the challenge, of course, is something we've been thinking about for over a decade, which is how do you do it responsibly? We've, uh, there's no more land. Water is a diminishing uh, resource. And about 75 to 80 percent of the world's uh, fresh water use is agriculture into our supply chains. Now, historically, what we've done is what everybody else did, which we said we focus on our operations, we're going to reduce water use, reduce our greenhouse gas impact, et cetera, within our own four walls. We did that very well. And as you probably know, we won the Stockholm Water Prize as being the industry leader only two years ago. Having said that, if I just look at PepsiCo's footprint, about 7% of our water use occurs within our own four walls. 93% is used in the supply chain all the way up through to the farmer. If we don't tackle that, we don't move the needle. And so what we've started to look at in terms of the challenges is how do we feed a growing population with different tastes, growing de demand for protein, uh, chronic um, illnesses, obesity, but also hunger, also mm -hmm. growing around the world, <coughs> diminishing resources, and a rapidly urbanizing population where the distance between where food is produced and for where food is consumed used to be measured in a mile, then it was tens of miles, then it was hundreds of miles, now it's thousands of miles. And as that's happened, there's an environmental price to pay, but also the types of food that you make and distribute and get it into the consumer's hands. So as we look at all of those challenges, we're going to collectively, there isn't going to be any one company, it isn't going to be just industry, but collectively, how do we get everybody at the table to actually figure out how to do this sustainably and responsibly. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of meeting where that discussion's got to happen. And what, is the, what are the challenges in the soft drink business that we all read a lot about and, and uh, is, is actually a much smaller part of Pepsi than most people realize? So the Pepsi but brand is about a tenth of our business. Worldwide, our soda business yeah. is about a quarter of our business, just on that. Yeah. And so there's no question that we've had to think about this. And you know, I'm an endocrinologist. Right. I took yeah. this job on 10 years ago. And we've been reformulating our products such that half of our business, even in our beverages of that quarter, is low calorie to zero calorie products. So mm -hmm. we've gone through rapid and massive transformation. But we have to bring the consumer along. The notion that you can tell consumers overnight what to do it doesn't happen. However, we didn't either. There was that, but we didn't have the technical solutions to change the products either. That is rapidly coming. We've just launched, for example, one of our big global brands is 7-Up. Mm -hmm. We have launched a 70-calorie 7-Up. We're launching it in 12 countries this year, rapidly expanding. And I'm not saying adding that as an option. We've removed the full sugar in those markets and substituted it with a 70-calorie product as the only option for 7-Up. We're now doing that with Mirinda. By the way, in international mm -hmm. markets, these are the big brands. Mm -hmm. Many international markets, cola is not the big brand. Mm -hmm. It is these flavors. So we're already doing this, and it's happening very rapidly. Great. Thank you. John, would you like to talk about Netafim and the challenges in the sure. water business? Sure, happy to. So uh, we're a relatively small company in the grand scheme of agriculture. We, and we you know, focus on, the, on the, you know, the beginning side of things. We're a company whose historic roots were in water conservation, and allowing Israeli farmers to, to grow crops in the, uh, in the desert. Um, and we had a, a fairly successful run for 50 or 60 years um, uh, selling that story to growers throughout the world, save water, and uh, um, you know, your situation will improve, I guess, is about the best way to put it. But you know, the, the challenge is that um, you know, the technology has been adopted in high value crops in advanced, um, advanced parts of the world. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount of agriculture still taking place that is flood irrigated with all of the uh, downstream problems that creates uh, that hasn't adopted it because it's, 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 uh, it's unaffordable for them. Um, the, um, the channel to get them the technology and to show them how to deploy it doesn't exist. 
Uh, here in the United States, we have challenges in that water is so cheap for many growers, the, the economic drive to adopt new technology isn't strong enough. We see that here in California, the most advanced uh, agri irrigated agricultural region maybe on the planet, uh, where many growers are still flood irrigating because they can get water very cheap, they don't want to spend $1,500 an acre for the system, they have other investment priorities perhaps. Uh, so as a, as a company, at least here in the States, we've, sh we've shifted our message somewhat uh, to one of helping growers become um, more productive. Because water, you know, water shortage or water savings is a play that only really works in a drought situation. We have the experience here in California where we had four years of drought, drip irrigation sales were great. Uh, now the drought is declared uh, dead and buried and uh, we see growers changing the way they view, they view the use of water uh, in, in such a short period of time. But we do know that um, coupled with the, the, right, um, the right traits, the right fertility practices, and the right technology to uh, measure uh, the results in the field, uh, that the, the quality of a crop and the productivity uh, per acre can be improved. So we're really focusing on providing a more comprehensive solution that includes uh, technology to deliver fertility more precisely, technology to monitor what's going on in the field and make more uh, rapid decisions. Uh, and, and actually partnering with other companies to identify um, traits that respond more, um, you know, better to drip irrigation as opposed to flood irrigation. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's sort of the direction we're going. Um, but I, th I think, you know, fundamental, if I, had, if, if I had to say what's the biggest challenge, it's, it's the affordability question. How do I get a, a farmer who's, you know, sort of a subsistence grower this technology that has proven itself to be so valuable in, in some format that they can that they can deploy in their field. Yeah. Thanks, John. And which countries are you all focusing on now? Because you're you're an Israeli company, but you really become a global company, and the growth is obviously going to be outside of Israel. Well, we're pretty much focused everywhere that uh, plants are grown. Uh, some areas more successfully than than others, but we see this technology is answering. Uh, I think what, what was raised earlier is this this sort of um, um, trajectory we're on where, where we have um, no more arable land unless we choose to chop down more rainforests, mm -hmm. uh, declining water quality throughout the world, uh, growing population, a billion of whom are already hungry, and we're projecting two more billion in, um, in uh, parts of the world where they're probably going to be hungry too. Uh, so so f really focused in, in Africa, China, uh, a lot of work in South and Central America. Because yeah. um, China has severe water problems. Mm -hmm have for many years and, yeah. and, and, and obviously a huge population. Yeah. Is that a big market for? It is a big, yeah. it is a big, big strategic market for NetFM. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think one other thing I'll add on the technology side that the challenge I see here in the U.S. market is there's a lot of people jumping into what is, what is called the technology space. Uh, and there are a lot of companies who haven't succeeded and I think fundamentally they're offering farmers uh, a, a lot of data potentially but I don't think anybody's really cracked the code as to what growers really want to see, mm -hmm. how much data they actually want and need um, in, a, in a format that they can understand and work yeah. with. Okay, thanks, John. Um, please feel free, by the way, to, to ask any questions. Um, um, another question that, that we get a lot is the, the issue of food safety. Um, we had a case this past year um, in the restaurant business with Chipotle where they had a, a number of food safety problems on the West Coast and in Boston uh, that knocked their stock down. At one point, it was down 50 percent. Um, how do all of you see the challenges of food safety, and and uh, what can we do to to avoid those problems and to convince consumers that that our products are safe? Well, let me. Um, if you th for those of you who think about the U.S. and the European Union, started this for good reason. Um, we have had a rewriting of the FDA's food safety modernization, the Food Safety Modernization Act. For those of you who have difficulty sleeping, it's about 850 pages. Mm -hmm. um, that was completely rewritten after about 50 years, and its first uh, enforcement started in 2016, and now it's rolling out. So this is a big global uh, supply chain um, uh, importance not just for products manufactured in the U.S., but into, uh, through the entire supply chain. And food and is a global supply chain. If you go to the local supermarket, there's no such thing mm -hmm. in any supermarket of just local food. The grapes that you get might be coming from South America. The spices are coming from India. Uh, you, you can track them around the world. 
does not matter. So we have to think of safety across these global supply chains. And companies like ours are looking and have been building the systems to be able to do traceability, uh, identify the different sources, do the right testing, maintain the records, etc. Uh, so that's the administrative start. We all need to do it. Remember, the large companies and agricultural systems evolved coming out of World War II because the heartland of America was hungry. One of the commonest reasons recruits in this country could not join the, the military at World War II because they were undernourished or had poor, poor, poor uh, high, oral and uh, physical hygiene. Mm -hmm. The USDA then asked the industry to scale up food but make it safe. Remember, foodborne illness was one of the commonest illnesses mm -hmm. that people like Pat and I would have seen as practicing physicians. That's mm -hmm. not the case anymore. And that's all the evolution that's happened. How did it happen? It was all of the technology that we've learned in terms of production, distribution, packaging, etc. Now, moving forward, how do you balance that with consumers who want clean label, want mi we need to do minimal packaging, and no preservatives, and have manufacturing processes that retain all the nutrients. And those are the technology opportunities. They're all solvable, but it's going to take a whole new wave of technology to realize, get to do that. And you were asking mm. about opportunity. There's tremendous opportunity. And that is some of the, the focus that different parts of the industry are now looking at. It's not just safety alone, but how do you create safe food that is also nutritious, and affordable. Right. You've got to put all three together. Any one of those is yeah. easy. Put the three together and do it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, please. Well, one thing that uh, hasn't been addressed is that consumers have moved, to, or activists have moved from attacking GMOs to attacking herbicides and pesticides. The consumers and environmental groups have moved from attacking GMOs and more or less gave up, and they moved on to attacking pesticides and herbicides. Mm -hmm. And there's also a science communication problem there, so that's going to affect everything, I imagine, if I want to see if you have anything to add about that. Yeah, I guess that, 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 that one lands in my lap, I guess. Um, so, you know, um, pesticides are going to still be used, um, and herbicides are going to still be used. The question is testing and exposure and, and understanding um, and making sure the science is correct about those pesticides, right? Um, and what that exposure is. Um, we believe there's ways to use those more sustainably in the future. So um, we're investors in a company called Blue River Technology based out of Silicon Valley. They're using a see and spray technology that they've developed using machine learning. So imagine a tractor moving down a field seven, eight miles an hour. It can see a weed, know it's a weed, and within fractions of a second be able to deliver very precisely a pesticide right to that weed to kill that weed and not touch the plant. Um, so that's a real revolutionary technology. And they, they believe they can drive down pesticide exposure very significantly. Today it's weeds and they're actually testing in cotton fields, and in Monsanto's cotton fields actually, um, in the southern U.S. Um, the next approach will be to look at for fungal disease. So we're seeing better disease detection happening all the time through machine learning and vision and remote sensing. And we think with those technologies and the use of things like drones and precision spraying, we can reduce pesticide applications to just regions of the field where it's going to be needed. And then lastly, I think there's still the genetic approach um, that has proved to be so successful in the U.S. We don't spray corn with insecticides in the United States because those corn plants are resistant to most of the insect pests. And we're able to keep up with the, the insect resistance both in the U.S. and in, the, in the Latin America. In the Financial Times yesterday, there was an article that fall armyworm, and I know you all know what that is, um, <laughs> is destroying the corn crop in, um, in the sub-Saharan Africa. Over $3 billion worth of damage is being done by this insect pest that came from North America, and it somehow got into the food chain and it's spreading very rapidly. The insecticides are now not working because the insect is resistant to them. Um, but many of those countries won't use insecticide resistant crops because they have a fear that somehow the GMO traits that are in those crops to make them resistant to insects is dangerous. So, so we've got to figure out how to break through and, and give growers and make growers successful with the right technology that's going to be safe. And we see a number of different ways that that can be attacked through precision applications as well as through genetic traits. I, I, I'll 
respond to a couple of the questions here. Um, the, uh, I think there's some very interesting possibilities if you think about um, the food system doesn't just have to be an uh, uh, incrementally improved version of today's food system. Um, the large majority, I would say, of pesticide use, um, just because of the magnitude of, of, of the crop, uh, is indirectly involved in um, producing food from animals. It's, it's the, the uh, corn and soybean crops, um, which no human will ever consume until it's turned into a pig or a chicken or a cow. And um, because of the extreme inefficiency of that process, you need vast amounts of crops and all the corresponding uh, um, you know, pesticides uh, that get applied to them. So thinking about the overall efficiency with which crops and land is converted into food for human consumption, mm -hmm. the, if you improve that, you, uh, you reduce the impact of everything that goes into those things. There's something else, and this is just a, a very far-fetched idea, but I think it's something that's worth thinking about, is that um, natural <laughs> ecosystems have evolved to um, have sort of a stable, steady state in the presence of what we would call weeds and pests and so forth. Um, and um, we create the problem by agricultural practices that are introducing something that effectively, so whenever you have a very concentrated amount of, of a host, whether it's an animal or a plant, it's a setup for uh, some kind of a, Mm -hmm. infestation attack. This sure. is why, you know, you crowd people together into spaces and you have a tuberculosis outbreak. Right. You crowd chickens together, you have avian influenza or whatever. Um, crowd crops together, you select for pests and weeds that, that grow in those lands. An interesting possibility is to say, let's rethink how we get our human nutrition. If you, every plant, uh, whether it's a crop or not, um, is loaded with nutrients, okay? The most abundant protein on earth is a protein that's in every leaf, rubisco. Right, rubisco. It's actually one of the most nutritionally optimal proteins known to man. But nobody can consume leaves as their primary food source unless, you know, because you'd have to eat 50 pounds of cellulose every day to meet your protein needs. But I had, that, dinner, I had dinner with you last night, that's what you did. I was trying because, because there were, there were, there were, there were, the only plant-based foods there were <laughs> Uh, I was trying to get my protein requirements from salad, but it didn't quite work. But anyway, <laughs> um, you need another gut. <laughs> but the, but actually, the thing is that now now we know how to recover those nutrients from plants, and we can say, okay, now we're not stuck with corn and soybeans. Let let's look at plants and not even crops that are single crops, but mixed systems uh, that we harvest, and we say we're going to pull the protein and the nutrients, the carotenoids and stuff like that, out of those things we have the tools to do that. So it's just, that's not something that's currently done. We're actually looking ahead impossible foods to what crop, you know, what plant sources of protein for the human diet should be in 10 or 20 years. And my guess is they're gonna be very different from the ones we're using now for some of those reasons. In fact, I'll just throw in one more wild idea. I'm sorry to yeah, carry on, no, but 45% of the pro photosynthetic productivity uh, on Earth is uh, um, uh, marine phytoplankton. I mean, it's a, it's a microalgae in, in, in the ocean. It's not used as a food source, but just as a, as, a, as a thought. If we could find a way without concentrating concentrated culture, but to harvest it in the wild, we could feed the human population with about 2% of its productivity. The life cycle of those organisms is much faster than land-based crops, so they, they re replenish very quickly. No fertilizer, no pesticides. It's a stable, self-sustaining system. No irrigation. Um, so what would all of us do? <laughs> your job we'd, would be would be to no take no irrigation, no no no. no. Plants, We'd no. sit on the beach and watch the algae grow. So. <laughs> Listen, there you know, there's there's they're just going to be the next set of challenges for making the world better. And I feel like you know. Uh, uh, what you could do is make unbelievably delicious foods out of a new set of ingredients. That's something that, you know, the whole history of food is 
is people applying their creativity to foods from nature and making something that's better than the sum of the parts. So that's, that's, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would just chime in yeah. here. I think the, you can't lose sight of the fact that we have a billion people hungry right now and two yeah. billion more coming. So I don't think anybody really needs to be too concerned about their job. It's just, uh, you know, yeah. I think what you're suggesting makes great sense in the context of an expanding population. There'll still be plenty of work for the rest of us to do because farming will of have course. to... Yeah, so, you always need farmers. Yeah, yeah. Let me just farmers. jump in and I'll take my scientist hat off for a second. And you have to ask yourselves, there are new things we have to invent, and clearly we will continue to do that. But there's also a huge current opportunity. There's the future of how we might do it. But there's somebody hungry today in South Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, I should say. There's people hungry in our inner cities. There's about... 50 to 60 million Americans who live on subsidized food, 30 mm -hmm. to 40 million mm -hmm. are on the SNAP program. That's today, mm -hmm. today's lunchtime. So I always remind myself, we gotta think about the future and get that taken care of. We've also gotta take care of today uh, and what we're gonna do. Now, if you ask ourselves, let's not think about what we have to invent, but what about if we just deploy what we already know, mm -hmm. okay? There's a few striking facts. First of all, India grows enough food to feed its entire population already. It doesn't need to grow anymore. It already grows enough to feed its entire mm -hmm. population and more. Yeah, it's, about a, it's 40, a net exporter, India. About 40% of its food goes to waste. Yeah. Okay? About 30 to 40% of our planet's production of food today mm -hmm. is thrown away, either in the garbage or it rots. It doesn't get distributed. Mm -hmm. So. First of all, if we could s s prevent half of that food loss today, we can feed every one of those billion people mm -hmm. without having to grow any more food, without any carbon impact, without any more water need, any more pesticide or any more fertilizer. So while we're figuring out how to do this new technology and deployment, let's also have make sure we're figuring out to conserve what we already have done. Mm -hmm. That's one. Secondly, if we take all the technologies we have available to us today, and we did a, a pilot at PepsiCo, but started it five years ago, and we put a s stake in the ground and we said, we're gonna take a look at our, water, our uh, potato farms in the southeast of England. We partnered with Cambridge University, a UN program, local technology companies, and we said, we're not gonna invent anything new. We're gonna deploy our current available irrigation technologies, digital mapping, software, uh, algorithms, feed the information back to the farmers, and we said, we want you to cut your water use by 50%, cut your greenhouse gas production, and not decrease yield without having to invent anything but just deploy technologies available today. Mm -hmm. Program just ended its fifth year, we achieved 50% reduction in water use, we achieved reduction in greenhouse gas production, and we did not diminish yield, in fact, yield went up. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is, is it invention that we need? Or is it the will of society, the financial models, and the industry coming together with the right government players and academics and say, let's pause for a second, deploy everything we know how to do today, mm -hmm. find the incentives to incentivize that, and two things will happen. We could therefore, based on that pilot alone, mm -hmm. cut water use substantially, feed the planet with what we already know how to do, and if we can conserve half of the, wa the food we waste, not produce anymore, just distribute it right, we can save the planet and save our people and humanity without any more of the rest. So let's all not forget that. Yeah, I, I, I completely disagree with that last sentence. <laughs> uh, I, you, you need both. I didn't say we didn't need both. I you said, said without any more of the other stuff. But anyway, but I think you need both. <laughs> you need both because, because I completely agree with you. In fact, it, 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 it turns out that today's harvest of just the four big commodity crops, which you know, I think are not the crops of the future, but if you just look at this, rice, corn, wheat, and soybeans, contains more calories, more protein, more of every essential amino acids than would be required to meet all the macronutrient needs of the world in 2050. So it's true that that mm -hmm. there's a lot we could do without fundamental changes in the system. But right now, also keep in mind that 45% of every square inch of land on Earth is actively in use raising animals for food. That's according to the International Livestock Research Institute, Better Lives Through Livestock. It's, um, 
Uh, so. They need some marketing help. Yeah. <laughs> Not from us. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're a very, they're, they're, they're a very well intentioned, good group of scientists. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're in the wrong industry. But, um, <laughs> but, but seriously, the point is that, and the demand for, for those foods is going to increase by at least 50% in the next 30 years. And right now, in the past 40 years, according to the World Wildlife Fund, we have reduced the total number of living wild animals on Earth across pretty much the, the entire spectrum uh, by more than half. There's less than half as many wild animals living on Earth today than there were 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And again, according to the World Wildlife Fund, overwhelmingly that's because of habitat loss and, and degradation by the expansion of animal agriculture, which is only going to get worse. So, so yes, we have to do what you're talking about, but that doesn't solve the whole problem. We have to. We're using a prehistoric technology, animals, to produce this category of food that the world loves and will never stop eating. And if we keep using that prehistoric technology, we're, we're going to have serious problems. We're hosed. I would just, sorry. sorry, I was sorry. just going to make one other comment. I mean, in your study that you talked about, I just the one comment is data analytics drove your ability to yes. reduce water. And in many parts of agriculture, growers don't have access to that data. In many parts of the food chain, we don't have access to that data. And, and I'm agreeing. What yeah. I'm saying is, yeah. but we can use we, that. We have the yeah. capability. It's a question of deployment. Exactly. Which then means financial models, supplied. It's not what I would do in my former life in the lab alone. Mm -hmm. It's take what that has been done, but better figure out the system. And Pat, I'm agreeing with you, but it's a system issue. It's not inventing one more widget alone. It won't sure. do it. Oh, no, you have to completely right. rethink the system, I agree. Ma'am? Okay. Um, you know, so I'm a dietitian, and I have a question, which is, it goes to, you, you said earlier, I think it was John, that um, consumers are not reading your science studies online. Um, I think the key thing is they just don't trust you, and they don't really trust any of us in this space. And so I think we have a, a real trust issue. I mean, at the end of the day, my room is packed with, my, my office is packed with people who don't want to die, are tired of losing the people in their lives, and are tired of not feeling well. And so I think the issue that we have today is not when, we, when people are hearing about all these things that we could be doing to feed the future, the question mark is, is how do we believe you that you're going to feed a future where we're actually healthier, that we feel better. So I guess I'd love, as you were talking, I'd love that you brought up the food waste issue, Mahmoud. So, but yeah. as you're thinking about uh, some of the recommendations that you're making, and, and certainly moving to more of a plant-based diet is a key part, how do you gain consumer trust that the cancer, I mean, we heard in the morning panel today that despite all of the innovation that we have, the cancer rates are not, they're not getting, the cancer deaths are not getting better. So how do we trust that food and better food and more food, as we're talking about, is actually going to be the solution for two billion and that we're not going to just create two billion sick people dying of cancer or of, you know, or unhealthy? Um, well, I, I, this is not directed at me, but I, I, I would say, um, you know, the way that we're approaching it, and I feel like you have to do this, is that, you know, when I founded my company, I did, it wasn't because I wanted to go in the food business. It wasn't that I wanted to go into business at all. Uh, it was that I wanted to solve a big problem. And one of the founding principles of our company, which I feel like is, uh, you know, it's critical for any food company is we're never going to produce a product that we don't believe is better for the consumer than what it replaces and is the best, most healthiest product we can possibly produce for that. And that, uh, um, that's not a marketing message. It's something you have to just live and breathe. And, uh, and secondly, a corollary of that is we have to candidly answer every question from consumers and show them everything that we put in our product how we assemble it, and, and why we've made all those choices, and provide as much nutritional information about those ingredients as possible to consumers so that they, they understand what we're giving them. They won't necessarily all read it, but, um, but you know, we're, we're doing our best to educate them. And I feel like the thing, part of the reason for the distrust, I think, you know, I'm an outsider, so you guys know this better than I do, but of the food industry is just, I would say, there certainly have been cases where the big food producers have not been primarily uh, driven by trying to um, take care of their consumers. 
And, and if that's not internally true, you can't fake it. Um, and secondly, if, um, if you're not transparent, consumers just feel like, whether true or not, that, that there's some, if, if, if you're not completely transparent about what's in the food, you're just basically sending the message with blazing sirens that you're doing something sketchy against the interests of the customer. So I feel like that's been a, a, a real problem, I would say, traditionally for the food industry. Yeah, so, you know, as, as you know, uh, j just as well as anybody, I used to hear um, this term that consumers are confused uh, about what's healthy, what's not healthy. Transparency is no question. Uh, in my mind, the consumer wants more and more transparency. In fact, they go as far as they want to recognize the ingredients as something they would. However, the one thing I would gently disagree with you, Pat, on is they don't want processed either. And the minute you say, I'm going to take what you recognize, now extract from it mm -hmm. a component, recompose it, I think that sounds like processing. I think and, that and, sounds and, like food. Because yeah. no, no, let me finish. <laughs> let, me finish. <laughs> let me finish. So, Processing, we have to get the consumer to accept that cooking is processing. Baking bread is processing. But processing has become used as a term yeah. that, that is confused. But what I was going was, it's not just the consumers are confused. The experts are confused. My problem is I don't even know. And, you know, I've had gazillion years of graduate training in this field, and I do not now know by looking at all the expert opinions as what is supposed to be good for me. And if somebody who practices in the field, like you do, cannot distinctly tell me what the literature says, so let's not start with the consumer. We don't have a consensus amongst the experts. And I think until we get there, where government agencies, academic institutions, the expert, quote, tell us with some consensus, I would challenge you to show me what that consensus is. Tell me even the definition of what is healthy. Let me just change, just for a second, your question a little bit, yeah. which is, should we be faced with consumer push, <laughs> uh, in industry push or consumer pull? And isn't Both. the real problem we're facing, I mean, consumers, we all can agree on basic things of what's healthy, eating less, uh, all of the different things in general terms. Does the consumer want that? Will the consumer pay for that? What's our role in terms of convincing the consumer of what's a healthy diet, what's not a healthy diet. Uh, we have many examples of companies that have tried that aggressively and failed as a company because the consumer didn't want it. Well, for 20 years I practiced medicine. Yeah. A decade of that was with diabetes and endocrinology. I could never mandate and tell right. my patients what to eat. But did they follow uh, your instructions? No. That's what I said. I yeah. couldn't mandate. Right. It, okay. So you'd have the dietitian say, here's what yeah. you should eat. Here. The doctor spends their time vast majority of the patients leaving the doctor's office go back to doing what they normally do, okay? So that is nature. We have to nudge consumers along. You cannot just suddenly right. say, this is what's good for you. Handing them a sheet doesn't change behavior. Nudging them to where this is going, you've got to take the consumer with you. Just suddenly changing because you think it's the right thing will not no. change it. I mean, you're practicing, yeah. still practicing. Right? Um, uh, yes. <clears throat> in the gene editing space, it, it, it's more than gene editing, it's more about going from transgenic to non-transgenics. And the move from transgenic to non-transgenics is, is really a big evolution that's going on. And the regulatory authorities around the world are starting to accept non-transgenics as non-GMO. They're starting to approve them, they're easier processing, much more traits that are allowed. And so it's a revolution that's happening in real time. I don't know if you have any comments on it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, absolutely a revolution that's happening in real time. So since the 2012 publication, I think it's like 3,500 papers using gene editing and a lot of those in plants. So the academic community has jumped all over this and they're making all kinds of inventions. And I, and I think the regulatory field is coming along. I wouldn't, I'm not, you know, I was someone who said, ah, oh, this GMO stuff's going to go away in 10 years um, when I had an ag biotech company. And of course, it was like the tide that always just kept coming in, right? So um, I think we've got to be careful about the gene editing space, particularly with European regulators. Um, there's a lot of views around the Cartagena protocols that if this involves DNA in vitro, it is in fact genetically engineered. So you may get away from the GMO label because that means a foreign gene, but if someone has manipulated DNA in vitro, that becomes genetically engineered. And we could start seeing 
for instance, regulatory authorities demanding that we put that kind of label on food. But you know, that's not, that's not what's happening in Europe, actually. So there are parts of the genetic space in Europe that they are saying, because it's the same, it's indistinguishable from the same trait that comes from breeding, that they're approving it. And so there are seven, eight countries, Germany, yep. France, have all said. But there, there's limits on what they're allowing, right? Well, the question is changing it in real time. Yeah. So that's encouraging, very encouraging. Hi. Uh, so if what you said, so maybe I introduce myself. My name is Andre Schrika, I'm like from Selected. Uh, oh, yeah. So if, uh, okay. One of the leading companies in the yeah. genome editing space, for those and of you that don't know Selected. Yeah. yeah, we had like several plants approved by the USDA as non-GM, actually. But yep. one of the things, if what you say is true, if like any genetic change is true, why tilling is not considered then for as GM or any chemical mutations? Therefore, you had to reconsider all the food chain at the end. I'm just saying I've, I've, you know, I've heard discussions that have gone down that route. So um, I'm cautious because of what we went through with GMO traits and things like that, that you know, we've got to move the whole industry along together and getting these things approved and explaining to most of the public. Most of the public doesn't even understand what genome editing is. So, Yes, yeah. in the back. Thank you. I'm Ambassador Kumsen, a former ambassador of Ghana to the U.S. And the GMO issue is something that uh, we in Africa, you know, have wrestled with. Uh, there are occasions where food donated to various African countries have had to stay in uh, warehouses uh, because of the either lack of information or, you know, misinformation that has been filtered into us. The continent is literally, literally cannot feed itself. I have two questions. One, what's your opinion of, about the real benefit G GMO, you know, uh, food, food stuff? can do to the African who is starving. And second, with a population of 1.3 billion and not being able to feed itself, is there a mechanism that can be used through this, in, through this conference to encourage American companies to look into the basic grain, the basic commodities that Africans see so that these, they can partner with local companies to produce these. For instance, in my country, we import about $600 million worth of rice every year mostly from Southeast Asia, less than 2% from the U.S. We import about half a, mil, uh, half a billion dollars worth of um, uh, fish. We have a coastline. So my question is, what framework can this forum put together? i would be delighted to work with you all to really tap into American businesses that can take advantage of this humongous food opportunity in Africa. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Very interesting question. Me, no, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me just, I don't, I don't have an answer, Ambassador, and thank you for raising that question. But one of the things it does beg is every region of the world has an ecosystem of its own plant and animal life. Our historical model has been to take a few crops, about half a dozen of them account for 70, 80 percent, I forget the number, of global calories. Isn't it time that we perhaps step back and say, what is the right plant varieties for that region in that ecosystem? It is likely that they have developed to be more disease resistant, more adapted to that climate and those soils and the microbiome, whatever you want to, variable you want to look at. And so is it about taking global crops and finding out a better way of growing them in Africa? Or is it about finding African crops that can grow in Africa better? Uh, and while I don't have, I think, I think there is an opportunity for our industry collectively to rethink region by region, which is not globalizing single uniform crops. The other risk is, look, let's take a look at what's happened to an industry that's close to our supply chain, which is in the citrus. Mm -hmm. Florida has lost 50% of its orange production because of one disease, citrus greening, in a decade. It's wiped out half of the citrus growth production. And it's going to continue. It's now arrived in California. It's in Brazil. Part of this is uniform crops. So maybe the answer is to learn from the African ecosystem and bring our expertise, but also help the, take the knowledge of Africa for Africa. One, I think we have time for one last question. Yes. 
Hi, I run a sustainable investment firm and we uh, build customized portfolios for our clients based on themes they care about. We've invested in ranges of food and agriculture and the challenge for us is you say that, you know, there's a ton of food waste which we've invested in optimization of food waste, but in the US specifically there's a gap of a billion dollars where we're importing organic uh, food product for consumers in the US. How are you guys thinking about that from moving into organics? And then on the other side, I'm not sure if there's more data on this, but oftentimes it's suggested that GMO products actually reduce water usage. And so where's the conflict on focusing on water usage and climate change and demands uh, by US consumers <coughs> for organics? And we so have 15 seconds to answer I can, that. <laughs> so just let me answer the water one quickly. So Monsanto mm -hmm. introduced a trait called drought guard in corn about three, four years ago, um, where we produced a trait that actually protects corn plants from severe drought and allows them to recover um, successfully from, the, from severe drought. And that may be the product you're referring to. That has grown, so farmers are planting more and more of that um, throughout the Midwest as kind of insurance against drought. So that's, that's one example of where that's come along. Now very quickly on the food waste, since we have what, 10 seconds, depends on which part of the world you're talking about. In Southeast Asia, most of the food loss is because of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Distribution system, preservation system, processing capability, the ability to cool and have chill distribution, all of those contribute. And so uh, Africa and Asia loses about 40 to 50 percent of its fruits and vegetable crop. Half of its crop is destroyed because of that. As opposed to in Western Europe and North America where it might be 20 percent. That 30 percent gap is infrastructure. North America and Western Europe, most of our food loss is post-purchase. Post we throw it out of our kitchens and we throw it out of our restaurants. So that's going to need a rethink uh, and you know, it shouldn't be ending up in the landfill. What can we do? It, is that a packaging? Is it a shelf life? Is it portion size? All of those things. We have to think of this as a system. Great. Well, thank you, my fellow panelists. Thank you all. I hope, I hope the last, I hope you're left. Thank you. I hope you're left with two things. One is that our industry has great forward-thinking people, scientists, thoughtful people. Uh, and second, it's, it's an industry that is really evolving with disruptors like Pat and many other of these companies. And, and so the next 20, 30 years should be exciting, challenging, and very interesting for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.